Yeah, hi. Um, what I want to speak about today is a book that I've been reading. Uh, <clears throat> the book was written by uh, Sir Frederick uh, John Daltrey Lugard, uh, who was the man responsible for creating <clears throat> no, the modern Nigeria as we know it. Excuse my phone. He, um, <clears throat> his wife was uh, Flora, I think it's Flora Shaw, um, get me if I'm wrong. She herself was a traveler of West Africa, and uh, he himself was uh, a product of empire. He's, his developing years was in India, and uh, he went to the UK for his uh, prep school and independent school education. <clears throat> I'm back, he was a soldier, um, and sort of served in Hong Kong, served in uh, East Africa, and um, West Africa, Nigeria. Now, <clears throat> he wrote a book. That book is called The Dual Mandate. Now, this book is very, very important. Okay. Um, the book is akin to um, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations or Karl Marx's Das Kapital or what the Bible is to a Christianity. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it sets out clearly what British aims were in uh, tropical Africa as it's called, the dual mandate in tropical, British tropical Africa, okay and it is very very comprehensive it really goes down to all things, now <clears throat> the uh, couple of things is it's a book written of the times it has a chauvinistic uh, viewpoint in terms of the superiority of Western culture over and above other cultures. Um, however, uh, he has a very, very realistic view about what Britain's aims are in Africa. And chiefly, it's acting as a conduit, uh, as a mentor for uh, an area which hasn't been developed as well as, say, the Western world. Okay, and it's about trying to uh, transform the existing uh, societies and structures in a manner which will bring it into modernization. Now, it can be argued that who the hell were the British to come in and impose their ideas and ideals, etc. But here is the rub. <clears throat> Many years ago, I remember going to a charity shop, get all my good stuff from charity shop. And there was magazines, some magazines, and they were like old, over a hundred years old. And it was about uh, cultures of the world. And the particular magazines which I got were about West Africa and how West Africans were living. And it was pretty dire. I mean, literally, yeah. Uh, there was a lot of mud houses around. And uh, obviously there's a lot of superstition, okay. Uh, I'm not really going into the Islamic area of things. <clears throat> um, there is in Africa still mud huts, if people live in. And I'm not talking about people who are very sort of removed from Western civilization or civilization in general. Um, we're just talking about everyday folk in Africa. They do in the rural areas. Some of them still live in sort of mud huts or very, you know, not very good structured uh, buildings. <clears throat> One of the problems in Africa is that people die of various tropical diseases very, very quickly. Uh, when I was traveling in Africa, a lot of people I knew and were friends with passed away under 40. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that breeds a lot of superstition. So if you have an argument with one person and you curse them, you know, I'll get you, I'll kill you, I hope you die. And two weeks later, they die of some disease which is unknown because maybe they can't afford the medicine or they just don't know what you know what they've died of. Okay, then the society are going to be looking at you having made the curse and the insult. Okay, if we go back on one our own uh, Western civilization back, you had that whole situation with witches and the witch hunt. And you know, you, you, if they suspected you were a witch, what they would do is they would dunk you. In a, in a pond, yeah? And uh, if you died, then you wasn't a witch. And if you were alive, 
you were a witch, at which point you got burnt to the stake. And that was all fed around superstition, okay? Well, that sort of mindset is prohibitive to many advancements, okay? And so uh, Frederick Lugard talks about the role of Western society engaging with the various civilizations in Africa in a manner of bringing it out of that area and progressing it further. So he goes into a great detail about um, A, uh, eradicating the slave trade and slavery in general. Now, uh, my little note was that he did sidestep, in my opinion, about the transatlantic slave trade. His focus at that time was on Africa and eradicating the slave trade in Africa at that time, which is the turn of the 20th century. So slavery had been abolished for like 70 years, technically speaking. But within Africa in and of itself, it was a strong part of the fabric of the culture, particularly in East Africa and within Muslim states. Talks about things like polygamy. Okay, now, uh, I was speaking to a relative of mine who was explaining to me about polygamy and what polygamy was about in uh, Yoruba, uh, West Africa, Nigeria. And he was explaining that a, a lot of the uh, farmers there indulged in polygamy, uh, mainly to produce lots of children who could all work on the farm. Okay, So it wasn't like here in the West where they're looking at it purely from a sexual situation in regards to one man, multiple women, and everyone's sort of like, you know, having a great time in the bedroom. Wrong focus. They're looking at it as in having lots of children, okay, and creating a community to work on the farmland. In effect, they're almost like um, slaves in and of themselves. However, they're always for communal benefit. But as uh, time's gone on and progression, you have monogamy and the introduction of Christianity within the area, um, and then people moving away from the farms, okay, into the cities, the polygamous area in nature has rescinded, okay. Um, so he goes into great details about the problems of slavery and also about the minds of slaves. You know, some slaves, they don't even want to be freed, he was explaining, yeah. Really goes into great detail about it, uh, about trying to move that transition, about when they've uh, rescued slaves, the problem as to where is it, they actually have come from talks about uh, 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 women husbands yeah where women were sort of uh, marrying other women uh, not for their own particular sexual gratification or lesbianism but more in terms of creating a brothel yeah using the ideas of dowries and bride price all that sort of conundrum and he looks at that and he analyzes that and, and, and tries to navigate a way through that. He talks about education, okay, and the importance of education, the level of education, about trying to instruct the existing elites uh, through education, but at the same time, trying to preserve their existing structures, uh, uh, cultures and customs. He also talks about the, um, the uh, you know, this, is, this, is, this is like a textbook on colonialism, if you like. So, for example, the two major elements uh, for this sort of colonial rule, if you like, is the use of um, the British having a monopoly over the violence or force and taxation. So, by taking the idea of the, um, the, the nat native uh, leaders and rulers of having their own particular private armies, saying, no, we, we, are, we will be in your army now, we will be protection, okay uh, that's taking some of the power out of them okay so now they're having to refer to the british at the same time creating and raising taxes now those taxes were dual taxes there were taxes uh, which were paid to the british in regards to the administration of the colony the creation of roads etc the building of schools and plants for schools although uh, the education was a small percentage of the overall expenditure okay <clears throat> Uh, uh, and also the uh, native chiefs were also given 50% of the levy of the taxation which they created. Talks about the role of district officers engaging with the, uh, the traditional leaders um, uh, and 
the idea that they are working together. You may have heard the phrase indirect rule. Um, this is what he's talking about. That is a rule indirectly through the existing uh, 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 social structures, uh, cultural structures. He has great fondness of uh, Islam uh, because of its practicalities uh, for a, uh, a, a, a Britain which is overstretched in the land mass and the numbers of people who actually engaged. For example, there were less than 10,000 uh, British colonial people in Nigeria. Yeah, at the turn of the century, probably about only 5,000. Okay, uh, so that rule was consensual and it was based on, a lot of it was based on so called treaties. Um, some of those treaties were highly dodgy. It was also um, uh, admitted after the Berlin Conference of 1884-85, okay, where uh, France uh, looked to assert its power after the defeat of the Franco-Prussian War but by looking towards Africa. And that created a great rush or scramble to Africa to, uh, to, to uh, how can I say, to identify and, de and create demarcations of areas of Africa which these uh, colonial influences should have had. Now, we can argue what right do these people have of coming into another land like they've done in America and taking over. But the reality is, and it's human nature, that if you have a powerful force which is structurally and technically more superior, that they are um, open to uh, exploiting, if you like, the... Um, lack of development of the other people in which they engage yeah so you know if someone's got a rock in their hand for example you go somewhere someone's got a rock in their hand and you say oh i'll give you i don't know uh, 50 pounds for that rock in your hand and the, the, the person you're dealing with it doesn't really have an interest in that rock you know and they say oh yeah here's that rock here you can have it you know no problem yeah but you you know that rock is a diamond okay and you know that where you are that rock has an immense value okay well that exchange what you've just done uh should you pay the market value to the person you bought that rock off who has no understanding of what that value is because they're living in a society which don't know the, the, the value of that particular thing because it has no value in its community okay these are the important questions what we have to ask so with Lugard, he looks upon uh, British administration as a custodial trusteeship in terms of uh, making the economies work for themselves, uh, obviously getting benefits from markets, securing markets to British uh, as opposed to other areas, uh, and also colonising the land so that, um, you know, that the lingua franca, if you like, uh, would be English, okay? Um, so various areas like that. Now we do talk. You know, there is a lot of talk about slavism and, and the amount of people the British Empire murdered. In all honesty, the, the empire wasn't about killing people. Okay, and it can be argued that the British Empire actually saved more people by uh, providing medicines, uh, focusing on uh, uh, childbirth. Okay giving certain medicines uh, to the population so that they could not fall prey to certain diseases such as yellow fever, uh, etc. And, and all sorts of stuff, typhoid, etc. Okay, so a lot of people actually sort of lived longer, yeah, as a result of the uh, implementations of uh, the uh, British colonial powers. But likewise, it could be argued that when you compare how the, say, working class was living uh, in England at that time, for example, their lives weren't that great, or so great either, okay? So we've got to put things into context. He goes into detail, lots of detail, about women's education and the importance of it, yeah? Uh, even to, uh, in regards to the roads, uh, administration and the court system. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is, you can't really talk about British colonialism, unless you've read this book, and it's a tomb of a book, let's be honest about it. It's over 600 pages. I've read about 500, yeah, I've read about 500 pages of this book. I've left out things like railways and stuff like that, but it covers general uh, principles of African land tenure, uh, contributions for defence, 
recommendations of economic committee. The system must be adapted to local traditions. Powers uh, exercised by native ruler. Yeah. Uh, interchange of officers, uh, committees and councils, unnecessary intervention, the work of the colonial office, house building even. Yeah, there's so many different areas and aspects in this. He talks about some of the intellectuals of the day uh, in America uh, to try and get an idea and inspiration as to how the uh, Africans could be developed within a sort of a Western type of uh, 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 culture, if you like. He sort of he telescopes that. Uh, and it's quite interesting. He talks about Devon De Beers. He talks about um, Marcus Garvey, I believe. Uh, he also talks about uh, oh, Booker T. Washington. Yeah, those great thinkers of their day. He he, he listens and analyzes what they have to say. He, he's very, he used lots of contextual notes uh, from other administrators and also from uh, Africans themselves. Okay, uh, what I'm trying to say is if you want a good understanding, a thorough understanding, an authoritative understanding of uh, Britain's aims within uh, uh, its empire in Africa. You've got to, this, this has got to be a start, okay? Uh, there's this and uh, another book, which I highly recommend, uh, which is The History of the Yoruba. I'll talk about this another time. It is a masterpiece written by uh, the Reverend uh, Samuel Johnson, who was uh, a Nigerian. Uh, the, the, the actual publication of this book is quite sad. It was published around the same time, turn of the 19th century. What is interesting is it really goes through the Yoruba culture in great depth and the history of the Yoruba, down to like tribal markings, what each tribal markings meant, the political system. It gives you a very comprehensive overview of the civilization of the Yorubas. Interestingly enough, uh, Frederick Lugard was a great um, he was a great fan of the Yorubas and highly respected them. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's that's what I wanted to say. Try to say that the British Empire wasn't all bad. Okay, uh, there are different ways. I think the view on the empire was hijacked post-war, mainly by the Americans, and that helps with the uh, revision, revisionist of uh, 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 the British Empire, because the Americans had a vested interest that the former colonial powers got rid of their empires. And that was to do with the amount of money which they'd lent these empires, which they owed them back, and the need to have more markets and publics to sell to. So you get this revisionist sort of view. Um, there's so, much, so many other elements to talk about. The uh, usurping of power from the educated elite in Africa, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the traditional rulers, who a lot of them didn't go to university, and so you've got this new sort of power dynamic uh, with people who are educated. They've been to Oxford, they've been to the higher uh, 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 education establishments of, say, uh, uh, of, of Britain, okay? And now they know just a little bit more than the, uh, the, the tribal king or tribal chief, okay? Um, it's interesting, I've, my main interesting, because my, my father, he was part of a royal family, and he was part of that... Um, group of people who were given a British education, uh, uh, tertiary education, uh, university education, uh, in order to help uh, with the governance of Nigeria and independent Nigeria. That whole independence thing happened way too quickly, okay? And it's a direct result of the Second World War. But anyway, that, that, I'll, I'll just, you know, I'll leave that as it is. But uh, yeah, just read that book, highly recommend it.